So yes, I uh, spent a lot of years in physics in uh, high performance computing for particle physics on the largest supercomputers of the world at Slack, working together with CERN. That was my background. And then I switched into machine learning startups. I've been doing this for the last uh, three and a half years or so. And last year I got uh, nominated and um, called a Big Data All-Star at the um, Fortune magazine. So that was a, a nice surprise. And you can follow me at Arno Kandel here. And uh, if anybody would be willing to take a picture and tweet it to me, that would be great. Thanks so much. So yes, today we're going to introduce H2O and then talk about deep learning a little bit in, in uh, more detail. And then there will be a lot of live demos. As much as time allows, I will go through all these different things. So we'll look at different data sets, different APIs, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that you have a good impression about what H2O can do for you and how it would look like, and that you definitely get an idea of what we can do here. So H2O is a in-memory machine learning platform. It's written in Java. It's open source. It distributes across your cluster. It sends the code around, not the data. So your data can stay on the cluster, and you have a large um, data set, right? And then you want to build models on the entire data set. You don't want to downsample and lose accuracy that way. But usual, the problem is that, that, that the tools don't allow you to scale to all the big data sets, especially for building machine learning models. Um, we're not just talking about summing up stuff or computing aggregates. We're talking about sophisticated models like gradient boosting machines or neural networks. And um, H2 allows you to do this, and you get the, the, the scalability and the accuracy from this big data set in scale. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of APIs that you'll get to see today. We also have a, a scoring engine, which is kind of a key point of the product. Um, we are about 35 people right now. We had our first uh, H2O World conference last year in uh, the fall, and it was a huge success. And uh, Shri Satish Ambari here, our CEO, he, had, uh, he has a great, great mindset and culture. Culture is everything to him, so he likes to do meetups every week, so even twice a week, to get feedback from customers and so on. So we are very much community driven, even though we write most of the code at this point. So you can see here the growth. Um, machine learning is really trending, and we think it's the next SQL, and prediction is the next search. And there's not just predictive analytics, there's also prescriptive analytics, where you're trying to not just say what's going to happen tomorrow, but you're going to tell the customers what to do such that they can affect tomorrow. So you can see the growth here. Lots and lots of companies are now using H2O. And why is that? Well, because it's a distributed system built by the experts in-house. We have Click, Cliff Click. He's our CTO. He wrote basically a Java compiler, JIT, right? Large parts of it. In every cell phone of yours, there's parts of his code that are executed all the time. So he architected the whole framework. It's a distributed in memory key value store based on a non-blocking hash map. It has um, a MapReduce paradigm built in, our own MapReduce, which is fine grain, and make sure that all the threads are working at all times if you're processing your data. And of course, all the nodes are working in parallel, as you'll see later. And we also compress the data similar to the Parquet data format. Um, so you can really store only the data you need. And it's much cheaper to decompress on the fly in the registers of the CPU than to send the, the numbers across the wire. And once you have this framework in place, you can write algorithms that are using this MapReduce paradigm. And you can also do less than an algorithm. You can just say compute aggregates, for example. It's, a, it's like a mini algorithm if you want. So you can do all these things. And in the end, you end up with a model that makes a prediction of the future, right? Standard machine learning. And that code can then be exported, and I'll show you that in a minute. And of course, we can suck in data from pretty much anywhere, and we can talk to R, Python, um, via JSON from a web browser. I, I routinely check the status of my jobs from my cell phone, for example. So there's a bunch of customers using us right now. These are the referenceable at this point. There's a lot more that we uh, can talk about at this moment, but um, you'll hear about them soon. Um, they're basically doing big data, right? Hundreds of gigabytes, um, dozens of nodes, and they're processing data all the time, and they have faster turnaround times. They're saving, model, uh, saving millions by deploying these 
models such as this fraud detection model that has uh, saved PayPal millions in fraud. So it's very easy to download. You just go to h2o.ai and you get, find the download button. You download it. Once it's downloaded, you unzip that, that file and you go in there and type java-jar, right? And that's it. h 2 will be running on your system. There's no dependencies. It's just one single file that you need and you're basically running. And you can do the same thing on a cluster. You spread the file everywhere and you launch it. That would be a bare bone installation. And if you don't want to do bare bones, you can do Hadoop. You can do Yarn, Spark. Uh, you can launch it from R and from Python as well. So let's do a quick demo here. This is GLM. So I'm going to a cluster here. This cluster has my name on it. We've got to dedicate a cluster for this demo. So let's see what this cluster is. This cluster is an eight node cluster on EC2. It has, um, I think, 30 gigabytes of heap per machine. Yep, here. And basically it's just there waiting for me to tell it what to do. So one thing I did earlier was I parsed this airlines data set. I'm going to do this again. The airlines data set has all the flights from 2007 all the way back to 1987. And it's parsing this right now. And let's go look at the CPU usage. Here you can see that all the nodes are active right now, sucking in the data and parsing it, tokenizing it, compressing it into these, these reduced representations that are lossless, of course. So when we have numbers like 7, 19, and 120, then you know that that fits into one byte, so you make a one byte column, right? Once you see that their numbers, there are more uh, dynamic range than just one byte, then you'll take two bytes and so on. You basically just store what you need. So okay. So now we parse this file in 35 seconds. Let's go look at the file. There's a frame summary that I'm expecting it um, from the server, and the server now returns this and says here, 160 million rows. Can you see this? There's 160 million rows, 30 columns, about four gigabytes compressed space. You see all these different um, columns here. They have like a summary, a cardinality. Some of them are categorical here. So in, in effect, there's about 700 predictors in this data set. And we're trying to predict whether the air um, plane is delayed or not based on its uh, like departure, origin, and destination, airport, and so on. So if I wanted to do this, I will just click here, build model. I will say generalized linear model. That's one that is fast. And the training frame is chosen here, and I will now choose some columns to use. I will first ignore all of them because there's a lot of columns I don't want to use, and then I'll add year, month, the day, the week, at the day of the week, uh, let's see, we want to know the departure time, maybe the carrier, not the flight number, that doesn't mean much, maybe the origin and destination, and then um, all we really care about is whether it's delayed or not, so that will be my response. Everything else we don't need, because it would give away the answer, right? So is departure delayed is what I'm going to, pre to predict, and it's a binomial problem, so yes or no is the answer. And now I just have to press go. And it's building this model as we, as we speak. And I can go to the water meter to see the, um, the CP usage. And you can see that all the, the nodes are busy computing this model right now. And in a few seconds, it will be done. You see the objective value doesn't change anymore. Yep. So it's done in 19 seconds. And I can look at the model. And I can see that. Uh, we have an, an AOC of non-0.5. It's a little more than 0.5, right? It's not just random. We, we have um, variable importances here. We can see that certain airlines, like Eastern Airlines, is, has a negative correlation with the response, which means it's, it's rarely, if, if you take this carrier, you're not going to be delayed. And that's because it didn't have a schedule. It was always on time, by definition, for example. So this is like one bit that comes out of this model. Another thing is that Chicago and Atlanta are often delayed when you start there, right? When your journey starts there, as you know. Or for example, San Francisco. Um, if you want to fly to San Francisco, there's a lot of people who want to do that. So that's why it's also often delayed. And as I mentioned earlier, the accuracy here flatlined after the first few iterations. So 
the model could have been done even faster. And if you're looking at the metrics here, for example, you can see that there's a mean square error reported, an R square value reported, all this data science stuff, AOC value of 0.65, and so on. And there's um, even a POJO that we can look at. You know what a POJO is, a plain old Java object? It's basically Java code. That's the scoring code that you can take into production that actually scores your flights in real time. And you could say, okay, if you're this airline and if you're at this time of day, then you're gonna have this probability to be delayed or not. And this is the optimal threshold computed from the ROC curve, that curve that you saw earlier that tells you where, where best to pick your, your operating regime to say delayed or not based on the false and positives and true positives and so on that you're balancing, right? So that's standard data science. It's all baked in for you. You get the answer right away. So this was on 160 million rows, and we just did this live. Um, so as you saw, the, the POJO scoring code, there's, there's more models that you can build. In, um, in the Flow user API, the, the GUI that you saw earlier, there's a, a help button on the right side here. If we bring this back up, there's help. I go down, and I can see here packs. So there's a bunch of example packs that come with it. So if I click on this here, I'll do this actually on my laptop now. Um, I'll show you how to run this on a laptop. So I, I just downloaded the, the package from the website and it only contains two files. One is an R package and one is the actual Java jar file. I'm gonna start this on my laptop and I'm going to check the browser localhost at port 54321, that's our default port. And now I'm connected to this Java JVM that I just launched, right? And I can ask it, um, this is a little too big now, let's make it smaller, here we go. I can look at the cluster status, yeah, it's a one node cluster, I gave it eight gigs of heap. You can see that and it's all ready to go. So now I'm going to launch this, um, this flow from this example pack, this million songs flow. I'm gonna load that notebook. And you can see this is the million song binary classification demo. We basically have a data set with 500,000 observations, 90 numerical columns, and we're going to split that and store it in S3. Well, that's done. You already have those files ready for you. So now we just have to parse them in here and I put them already on my laptop, so I can just say download um, and import into the uh, H2O cluster. And I'll take the non-zipped version because that's faster. So this, this file is a few hundred megabytes. It's done in uh, three seconds. And this one here is the test set. I'm also going to parse this. And you can see that you can even specify the column types. If you wanted to turn a number into an enum for classification, you can do this here explicitly. If you're not happy with the default behavior of the parser. But the parser is very robust and can usually handle that. So if you have missing values, if you have all kinds of categoricals, ugly strings, stuff that's wrong, it'll handle it. It's very robust. It's really made for enterprise grade data sets. It'll, it'll go through your dirty data and just spit something out that's usually pretty good. Okay, so now we have these data sets and I'll see what, what else we have here. So let me go back out here give you a view, you can click on outline on the right and you can see all these cells that I pre-populated here. And one of them says build a random forest, one says build a gradient boosting machine, one says build a linear model, logistic regression, and one says build a deep learning model, right? And I can just say, okay, fine, let's build one. Let's say, let's go down to the GBM cell and say execute this cell. Now it's building a gradient boosting machine on this data set. You can see the progress bar here. And while it's building it, I can say, hey, how do you look right now? Let me see how you're doing. So right now it's already giving me two scoring history points where the error went down. It's already an AOC curve, an ROC curve with an AOC of something like, let's see, 0.7 I would hope. Yes, 0.7 AOC already, right, in just seconds. That's pretty good for this data set. If I do it again, it's already down here. The error goes, keeps going down. And you can keep looking at that model, feature importances for which, which variables matter the most, all in real time. And you can also look at the POJO again. This time it's a tree model, not a logistic regression model. So you would expect some decisions in this uh, tree structure. So if I go down, 
there's all these classes. This is all like Java code. Um, I think the tree should be somewhere. Let me see. Um, I might have to refresh this model. Oh, here we go. So these are all the forests here. You see that there's a lot of forests that are being scored. Now we just have to find this function somewhere down there. And oh, here it is. So here you can see that this is decision tree logic, right? If your data is less than 4,000 in this column and less than this and less than that, then in the end your prediction will be so and so much. Otherwise, it will be this number. So basically, this is the scoring code of this model that you can put right into production in Storm or any other API that you want to use. Um, your own, basically, that's just Java code without any dependencies. And you can build the same thing with deep learning, right? You can build a deep learning model on the same data set at the same time that the other one is building. You can build a random forest model here also at the same time, or a GLM. And this is all on my laptop right now. So I'm building different models at the same time, and I can ask, hey, what's the status of them? I can just go to the right here in the outline and click on give me my deep learning model. Oh, it's already done. Let's see how well we're doing here. Also a good uh, AUC, right? And feature importances and the scoring history and the metrics. And you can even get a list of optimal metrics, like what's the best precision I can get? What's the best accuracy I can get? And then at what threshold? So this is all geared towards the um, data scientist understanding what's happening. All right. So while my laptop is churning out some more models, we can continue here and talk about deep learning in more detail. So deep learning, as you all know, is basically just connected neurons, right? And it's similar to logistic regression, except that there's more multiplications going on. Um, you, you take your feature times the weight, you get a number, and then you add it up. And you do this for all these connections here. Each connection is, is a product of the weight times the input gives you some output. And then you apply a nonlinear function like a 10H, something that's like a step function, a smooth step function. And you do this again and again and again, and in the end you have like a hierarchy of nonlinear transformations, which will lead to very complex nonlinearities in your model. So you can describe really weird stuff um, that you would otherwise not be able to with, say, a linear model or a simple random forest that doesn't go as deep to, to make up all these nonlinearities between all these features. So this is basically the, the machinery you need for nonlinearities in your data set. And we do this in a distributed way again because we're using the MapReduce. We're doing this again on all the threads, right? As you saw earlier for GLM and everything was green, deep learning is also green. It's known to be green. I usually burn up the whole cluster when I'm running my models and everybody else has to step back. Well, of course there's the Linux uh, scheduler that takes care of that, but still um, some claim it's not necessarily fair if I'm running some big model. So I haven't done that lately. And that's why I'm using these EC2 clusters now and maybe my laptop from time to time. But anyway, you can see here, um, we have a lot of little details built in, right? It works automatically on categorical data. It automatically standardizes, standardizes your data. So you don't need to worry about that. It automatically imputes missing values. It automatically does uh, regularization for you if you specify the option. It, it does uh, checkpointing, load balancing, everything. You just need to say go and that's it. So it should be like super easy for anyone to just run it. And if you want to know how it works in the detail um, architecture here, it's basically just distributing the, the, the data set at first, right, onto the whole cluster. Let's say you have a terabyte of data and 10 nodes. Every node will get 100 gigabytes, different data. And then you're saying, okay, I'll make an initial deep learning model that's a bunch of weights and bias values, all just numbers. And I'll, I'll put that into some place in the store. And then I spread that to all the nodes. All my 10 nodes get a, a copy of the same model. And then I say, train on your local data. So then all the, the models will, will get trained on their local data with multi-threading. So there's some race conditions here that makes this not reproducible. But in the end, you will have n models, in this case four, or on your cluster that I've just mentioned, 10. You will have 10 such models of that have been built on 
a part of these 100 gigabytes that you have. You don't have to process all the 100 gigabytes. You can just sample some of it, right? And then when you're done with that, you reduce it, basically. Automatically, it will get averaged back into one model. And that one model is the one that you look at from your browser or from R or from Python. And then you do this again. And every pass is a fraction of the data that you're passing through, or all of the data, or more than all of your data. You can just keep iterating without communicating. You can tell each node to just run for six weeks and then communicate. But by default, it's done in a way that you spend about 2% of your time communicating on a cluster and 98% computing. And this is all automatically done, so you don't need to worry about anything. You just say go, and it will basically process the data in parallel and make a good model. And this averaging of models, this scheme works. There's a paper about it. But I'm also working on a new scheme that's called um, um, consensus ADMM, where you basically have a penalty how far you drift from the average, but you keep your local model. And that keeps everybody kind of going on their own path in optimization land without averaging all the time. You just you know that you're drifting too far, so you get pulled back a little, but you still have your own model. So this is going to be a promising upgrade soon that you can look forward to. Um, Already as it is, it works fairly well. So this is the MNIST, right? The digits, zero to nine, handwritten digits, 784 grayscale pixels. You need to know which one is it, right? From the grayscale pixel values. And in, with a couple of lines here in R, you can get the world class. This is actually actual world record. No one has published a better number than this without using convolutional layers or any other distortions. This is purely on the 60,000 training samples. No distortions, no convolutions. And uh, you can see here all the other implementations, Jeff Hinton's and uh, Microsoft's. 0.83 is the world record. Of course, you could say the last digit is not quite statistically significant because you only have 10,000 test set points. But still, it's good to get down there. So now let's do a little demo here. Um, this is anomaly detection. I'll show you how we can detect the ugly digits in this MNIST data set on my laptop in a few seconds. So I just have this instance up and running here from before. So I'm going to go into R. In R, I have this R unit. This runs every day, right? Every time we commit something, these tests are being run. So you can def definitely check those out from your uh, GitHub web page right now if you want. Um, but still, this is saying build an autoencoder model which is learning what's normal. So it connects to my cluster right now. It learns what's normal, what is a normal digit, without knowing what digit it is. It just says, look at all the data and learn what's normal. And how does it do that? Well, it takes the 784 pixels. It compresses them into, in this case, 50 neurons, 50 numbers, and then tries to make it back into 784. So it's learning the identity function of this data set in a compressed way, right? So if you can somehow represent the data with these 50 numbers, and you know the weights connecting in and out, then these 50 numbers, they mean something. That's what it takes to represent those 10 digits, let's say. That's roughly five numbers per digit. And those five numbers are enough to say there's an edge here, there's a round thing here, there's a hole here, something like that, like the features. And with these 50 numbers in the middle, and of course the, the connectivity that make up uh, the reconstruction and the, basically the encoding and the decoding, um, you can now say what's normal or not. So because now I'll take the test set, I'll let it go through this network, and I see what comes out of the other side. If it doesn't look like the original input, then it didn't match my vision of what this should look like, right? So I'm going to let the test set go through this model. First, I need to train the model. So right now, it's building this model on my laptop, 50 hidden neurons, 10H activation function, and autoencoder is set to true. And I had a couple of extra options, but that's just to say, don't drop any of the constant columns that are always zero, because I want to plot it at the end. OK, so now let's look at the outlierness of every point. We just scored the test set and computed the Reconstruction error. So how, how different is the outcome from the income? How bad is my identity mapping that I learned for the test set points? And for those points that are kind of ugly, they won't match to what's normal in the training data, right? That's an intuitive thing. All right. So now let's plot 
the ones that match the best top 25. That's the reconstruction. And now let's look at the actual ones. Well, the same thing, right? They match the best, so they have to look like the same. This is the ones that are the easiest to, to learn to represent in your identity function. Just take the middle ones and say, keep them, basically. Now let's look at the ones in the middle out of 10,000. That's the, the ones, the median reconstruction error. So these are still reasonably good. You can tell that they're digits, but they're already not quite as pretty anymore. And now let's look at the ugliest outliers, so to speak, in the test set. So these are all digits that are um, coming out of my network, but they're not really like digits anymore, right? So something went wrong. Basically, the reconstruction failed. The model said these are ugly. And if you look at them, they are kind of ugly. Some of them are almost not digits anymore, right? They're cut off, or the top right one, for example, is ugly. And you can tell that if you remember the bottom line, like in the optics test, the vision exam, 64035, right? Let's go look at my slides. They're totally different. So every time I run it, it's different because it's neural nets with multi-threading. I can turn it on to be reproducible, but then I have to say use one thread. Don't do any of this hog wild race condition updates of the weight matrix by multiple threads at the same time. Just run one thread through and give a seed and then just wait until that one thread is done and then it will be reproducible. But in this case, I chose not to do this because it's faster this way and the results are fine anyway. Every time you run it, you'll get something like this. You will not get the ugly digits to be the good ones, right? So this shows you basically that this is a robust thing. And again, here, this is the network um, topography. So I can also go back to the browser now, go to localhost, and say here, clean up everything. By the way, here, this just ran all the models. So if I say get models, I should see all the models that were built. So the, the last four are the models that were built on the million song data set earlier. And the top one is the one I built from R, the autoencoder. And you can see the autoencoder reconstruction error started at 0 0.08 mean square error. And now it's at 0 0.02. So it got it down. It improved from random noise. For autoencoders, you always want to check this convergence. It has to learn something, right? The identity mapping. And you can also see here the status of the neuron layers, the thing I showed you earlier. And of course, you can also get a POJO again. Here in this case, it's a neural net. So you would expect some weights here and some uh, here. What is this? Oh, that's the neurons. Here we go. Um, I would expect the model to show up somewhere. See, there's a lot of um, declarations you have to make to know all these 784 features. So if this is too, too little for the preview, then we have to look at the other model we have. Yeah, let's go back to get models and click on the other deep learning model we made earlier on the million song data set and look at its POJO that should be smaller because there were only 90 predictors. Okay, here we go. So now you should see the, the deep learning math actually printed out in plain text. So you can always check here, activation, um, something with numerical, something with uh, categoricals, if you had any, in this case there are none. And then it will say weights, activation, biases, and it will do this matrix vector multiplication. So AX plus Y, if you want. This is the matrix vector multiplication that's inside of the deep learning model. And you can see here we do um, some partial sum tricks to be faster, to, to basically allow the CPU to do more additions and multiplication at the same time. So all of this is optimized for speed. And this is as fast as any C++ implementation or anything, because we don't really have um, GC issues here. All the arrays are allocated one time and then just processed. All right. So now let's get back to the uh, bigger problems, deep learning and Higgs boson. Who has seen this data set before? OK, great. So this is uh, physics, right? $13 billion, biggest project ever, scientific experiment. This data set has 10 million rows. They are detector events. Each detector event has 21 numbers coming out saying, this is what I measured for certain things. And then the physicists come up with seven more numbers that they compute from those 21. Something like square root of this squared minus that squared or something. And those formulas or formulae 
actually help. And you can see this down there. Um, if you take just the low level numbers, this is the AUC you get. So 0.5 is random and one would be perfect. And now it goes up by something like 10 basis points almost if you add those extra features. So it's very valuable to have physicists around that tell you like what to do, right? But CERN basically had this baseline here of 81. That was how good it was working for them. They used it gradient boosted uh, trees and neural networks with layer, with one layer, one hidden layer. So their baseline was 81 AUC. And this paper came along last summer saying we can do better than that with deep learning. Um, and they published some numbers. And now we are going to run the same thing and see what we can do. So I'm going back to my cluster, my uh, EC2 8 node cluster. And I'll say get frames. And I will have the Higgs data set there already because I parsed it earlier. You can see here 11 million rows um, and 29 columns, two gigabytes compressed. There's not much to compress because it's all doubles. And now I'm going to run a deep learning model. So I already saved the flow for that. So this flow says, um, take the split, the split data set, I split it into 90% and 5.5%, so 10 million and half a million each. Uh, take the training data and the validation data and tell me how you're doing along the way. So go, and it builds a three-layer network and uses a rectifier activation. Everything else is default. And now it's running. So let's go look at the, the water meter. Okay, here we go. Deep learning is taking over the cluster. And now it's communicating. And now it's sending that back out and then computing again. This might be initial phases where it tries to first um, Re rebalance the data set or something. Usually you'll see it up, down, up, down. So let's wait until the next communication. But you'll see that all the CPUs are busy updating weights with stochastic gradient descent, which means it takes uh, a point, it trains, uh, goes through the, through the network, makes a prediction, says how wrong it is, and corrects the weights. All the weights that are affected get fixed, basically, by every single point. There's no mini batch or anything. Every single point updates the whole model, and that's done by all the threads in parallel. So you'll have eight threads in parallel changing those weights. And I read, you write, I read, you write, whatever, we just compete. But usually we write different weights, right? There's millions of weights, so you don't need to overwrite too often what someone else is reading at the time or something. So you can see here it's mostly busy computing. If you wanted to know what it's exactly doing, you can also click on the profiler here, and it will show you a stack trace um, and sorted stack trace by count of what's happening. So this was basically just communicating. Let's do this again. Now it's going to be um, slightly different. Oh, I see. So now it was saying um, these are basically idle because we have eight nodes and there's seven others. And there's one for read and one for write. So we got 14 threads actively listening for communication. Here we have 289 are in the back propagation. Some of them are in the forward propagation. So you can see all these uh, exact things that are going on at any moment in time for every node, right? You can go to a different node and you can see the same behavior. So they're all just busy computing. So while this model is building, we can ask how well is it doing? Remember the 81 baseline um, with the human features. Let's, let's see what we have here on the validation data set. It's already at 79. This already beats um, all the random forest and gradient boosted methods and neural nets methods that they had at CERN for many years. So these models there on the left that had 75, 76, already beaten by this deep learning model we just ran. And this wasn't even a good model. It was just a small, like 100 neurons each layer, right? So this is very powerful. And by the time we finish, we'll actually get down to over 87 AUC. That's what the paper reported. They had an 88. And they trained this for weeks on a GPU. And of course, they had only this data set and nothing else to worry about. And this is a small data set still. But you can see the power of deep learning, right? Especially if you feed it more data and you give it more neurons, it'll train and learn everything. It's like a brain that's trying to learn, like a baby's brain. 
it's just sucking up all the information. And um, after 40 minutes, you'll get an 84 AOC, which is pretty impressive, right? It beats all the other baseline methods, even with the human features. And this is without using the human features. You don't need to know anything. You just take the sensor data out of your machine and say, go. All right. Another use case was a deep learning used for crime detection. And this is actually Chicago, if you can recognize this pattern. So my colleagues, Alex and Michal, they um, wrote an article, actually, that you can read here, Data Nami, just a few days ago. And they're using Spark and H2O together to take three different data sets and turn them into something that you can use to predict whether a crime um, is going to be leading to an arrest or not. So you take a, the, the crime data set, you take the census data set to know something about the socioeconomic factors, and you take the weather, because the weather might have impact on what's happening, and you put them all together in Spark. First, you parse them in H2O, because we know that the parser works and it's, it's fine. So in our demo, we just suck it all in in H2O. We send it over to Spark in the same JVM, and then we say, do an SQL join. And once you're done, we split it again in H2O, and then we build a deep learning model and, for example, a GBM model. I think these two are being built by the demo script that's available. So again, both H2O and Spark's um, memory is shared. It's the same JVM. There's no tachyon layer or anything. They are basically able to transparently go from one side to the other. And the product, of course, is called sparkling water, which was a brilliant idea, I think. All right, so this is the, uh, the place in GitHub where you would find this, this example. So you would download sparkling water from our download page, and then you would go into that directory, set two environment variables, pointing to Spark and saying how many nodes you want, and then you would start the sparkling shell, and then copy-paste this code into it, for example, if you want to do it interactively. So you can see here there's a couple of imports. Uh, you import deep learning and GBM and some Spark stuff, and then we basically uh, connect to the H2O cluster. We parse data sets. This way, this is just a function definition that gets used by these other functions that actually do the work to load the data. And then you can like, drop some columns and do some simple munging. In this case here, we do some date manipulations to standardize the three data sets to have the same date format so that we can join on it later. And we basically just take these three data sets. These are just small for a demo, but in reality, they, of course, use the whole data set on a cluster. And then once you have these three data sets in memory as H2O objects, we just convert it to a schema RDD with this call here. And now they become Spark RDDs, for which you can just call like a select statement in SQL and then some join and another join and all that. It's very nice, right? This is a nice, well understood API that people can use. And H2O does not have this at this point, but we're working on that. So at some point, we'll have more munging capabilities. But for now, you can definitely benefit from the whole Spark ecosystem to do um, what it's good for. So here in this case, um, what is this? We say here's a crime weather data set that we, after we split it, I think we, spend, we bring it back into H2O. Yes, this, this is an H2O uh, helper function to split. And now we have basically a joint data set that knows all about the socioeconomic factors, about the weather for a given time at a given place. And then we can build a deep learning model just like you would do this in Java. Scala is very similar, right? You don't need to do much porting. It's just the same members that you are setting. And then you say run uh, train model dot get, basically. And at, that, at the end, you have a model available that you can use to make predictions. And it's very simple. And you can definitely follow the, uh, the tutorials. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just show you the, sh the sparkling shell start here. I'm basically able to do this on my laptop as well. While the other one is still running, here you see Spark is being launched. And now it's scheduling those three worker nodes to come up. Once it's ready, I can copy paste some code in there. 
And the code I would get from the website here, Chicago Crime Demo, it's all on GitHub. So in sparkling water, our GitHub um, project, under examples, there are some scripts. And so I can just take this stuff here and just copy paste it all. Oops. Now, I'm sure you believe me that this is all doable, right? So here, Spark is now ready. And I just copy paste this in. And here it goes. So that's how easy it is to do Spark and H2O together. And then also, once you have something in your memory in the it show cluster, right, the model, for example, or some data sets, you can just ask Flow to visualize it. You can just type this, this JavaScript or CoffeeScript, rather, expression and plot anything you want against anything. And you'll see these interactive plots where you can mouse over and it will show you what it is and so on. So it's very cool. You can plot, for example, the arrest rate versus the relative occurrence of an arrest. So, if, for example, gambling is always arrested. Why is that? Well, because otherwise you wouldn't know that the gambling person was cheating or something. So, so you basically have to arrest them, right? Otherwise, you don't know what's happening. Some of the things are undetected. But the theft, for example, is not always arrested because someone knows that it was stolen without the person actually being caught. So you have to be careful about all this data science stuff. But basically, you can plot whatever you want against whatever you want. And that's pretty powerful. And we have um, our data table now in-house. So Matt Dowell joined us recently. He, he wrote the fastest data table uh, processing engine in R. And this is used for financial institutions that like to do aggregates a lot. So just what you saw on the previous slide, we'll soon have all this in H2O in a scalable way that we can do fast joins, aggregates, and so on. And the same thing, of course, goes for Python. You have IPython notebooks. And there's an example to do something for the city bike uh, company in New York City, where you want to know how many bikes do you need per station such that you don't run out of bikes. So let's say you have um, 10 million rows of historical data, and you have some weather data. You would imagine that you can join those two. And then basically, based on location and time and weather, you can predict how many bikes you'll need, right? So if I know today it's going to be, or tomorrow it's going to be that weather, I know I need 250 bikes at that station or something. And Cliff, our CTO who, who wrote the JIT, basically also wrote this data science example here. So you can see there's a group by at the top from IPython notebooks. And to show you that this is also live and possible, here I do this here. I type IPython notebook city bike small, and up pops up my, my, my browser with um, IPython notebook. I will delete all the output cells so we don't cheat. And I say go. And now it's connecting to the cluster that I started 30 minutes ago. This means I still have a little bit of time left. Um, I will load some data. Here we go. And then let's look at the data, describe it. You can see here some, some uh, um, mean, max, and so on, whatever. This is like a distribution of the chunk uh, of the frame. How many rows are on which machine? In this case, it's only one machine. Oops. There's only one machine. Basically, there's some statistics that tells you how is the data distributed across the cluster, what kinds of um, um, columns do I have, what is their mean, max, and so on, all available from, from Python. Then you can do a group by. You don't need to know all that, but basically, it's just you want to know like at what time of the day or what day, how many bikes are which station, and so on. You can see that there's a big distribution here. That's, that's some, some, some places only need nine bikes. Some places need 100 bikes or even more, and so on, right? And you can do quantiles. You see the quantiles here from 1% all the way to 99%. And you see that there's some um, pretty big numbers here. You can make new features, day of the week, and so on. You can um, build models. So this is the fun part. We have to build a GBM, we build a random forest, we build a GLM, and we build a deep learning model, all on the same data that was joined earlier. And so now let's say do this. Go. So now it's building a, a GBM all on my laptop. So if I went to my laptop right now, I could say get models, and these models would just magically pop up. 
and this is deep learning, and now we can see how well they're doing. And you get the idea, right? So now we get a 92 AOC by deep learning, but the 93 AOC by GBM. But deep learning even took a little less time than GBM. So you could say that both are very powerful methods. They beat the random forest and the linear models here. But of course, nothing beats the linear model in terms of time. 0.1 second to get an 81 AUC. It's pretty remarkable. It's 50 times faster than the random forest. All right, so you believe me that IPython works as well. Um, once you join the weather data with a simple merge command here in the middle somewhere, then you get a little lift here because then you can even predict whether you need bikes or not based on weather, right? It makes sense. If it rains, you might need fewer bikes. So any, anything you might wonder what to do with GBM, with linear models, with uh, deep learning, there's booklets for that. And we're currently rewriting them to the new version of H2O, which will have slightly um, updated APIs and stuff for consistency across R, Python, Scala, JSON, and so on. So it's going to be very nice and rewritten everything from scratch. Um, a major effort, but now we're basically going to be ready for release, I think, this week, actually. So, and another exclamation point is that we're currently number one at this Kaggle challenge. Um, Mark Landry, who just joined us, who has been on Team H2O for a while. He was at the H2O world last fall. He's actually going to work full time almost, or half his time on, on Kaggle challenges using H2O. So we'll be excited to see this go across the finish line. And uh, we'll, we'll share how we did this, or rather he will share how he did it, because so far Mark did most of the work, um, next week at H2O in Mountain View. And it will be live streamed as well. So if you can make it, be sure to uh, listen in. And these are some examples of other Kaggle applications where we have demo scripts that are posted that are available. And for example, this one I posted a few, maybe a month ago or so, I posted this example GBM, random parameter uh, tuning uh, logic, where you basically just make 10 models with random parameters and see which one is the best. That's sometimes useful, especially if you have many dimensions to optimize over. And we don't have Bayesian optimization yet. But this might be more efficient than just a brute force grid search because the machine gets luckier more than you tell it to be lucky if you want. That's why Monte Carlo integration works in higher than four dimensions. The same thing is true with hyperparameter finding. So don't shy away from these random approaches. They're very powerful. So this is the outlook. Uh, lots of stuff to do for data science now that we have this machinery in place that can scale to big data sets. Customers are saying, well, why do I need to find parameters, right? Yes, yeah, sure. Automatic hyperparameter tuning is great. We'll do that for you soon. We'll have ensembles, like a framework that you can, in the GUI and all, properly define what you want to blend together in what way. Uh, Non-negatively squares to, to stack models of different kinds, like a random forest and a GBM and so on, all on the holdout sets and so on. Then we want to have convolutional layers for deep learning. For example, for people who want to do more image-related stuff. Um, but all these things are on the to-do list, right? We have to prioritize those based on customer demand. So that's what our customers get to do. The paying customers get to tell us basically what they want, and they'll take that into account. Um, natural language processing is high up there, especially now that we have this framework. We can characterize each string as an integer and then process all that fast. And we have a new method called generalized low rank model, which comes right out of Stanford, brand new. Um, it can do all these methods, PCI, SVD, k-means, uh, matrix factorization, of course, all this stuff, fixing missing values for you based on like a tailored expansion of your data set. Very powerful stuff. It can also be used for recommender systems. And we have lots and lots of other uh, JIRA tickets and stuff to work on. So if you're interested in joining the effort, please do. And I hope I left you with an impression of what you can do with H2O and what the state of the art is right now in machine learning on big data sets. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>